In this tutorial, we're just going to look at the basics of homeostasis. So this is why it's an overview. First aim is, can you describe the term homeostasis? Then can you describe four factors that must be controlled by our body? And then can you explain how negative feedback is achieved? Now today's pictures of a frog. Now certain species of frog, like the wood frog, can do something no human can do. To survive the perils of winter, they can actually freeze themselves so they can survive a period in the year where there's low food availability. Now this is astonishingly achieved because even though on the exterior it will seem like they're frozen rock solid, but their blood becomes a thick sort of syrup that still flows slowly through their body keeping them alive. Remarkable. But this certainly isn't normal behaviour in the animal kingdom. Animals need to maintain a specific set of conditions inside their body to keep alive. This is called homeostasis. So I'm going to give you the textbook definition for homeostasis. If they ask you in an exam, what is homeostasis, this is exactly what you should say. Maintenance. So I've basically drawn a spanner fixing something there or maintaining something. Of a stable. So I've drawn some scales there. Stability. Internal. So I've drawn someone in prison there. Environment. So obviously our world there. So homeostasis is maintenance of a stable internal environment. Remember that. Say it again. Maintenance of a stable internal environment. What that basically means is no matter how factors or conditions in our environment may change, our, our body adjusts to make sure that our internal conditions remain the same and so we stay alive. So that is how you describe the term homeostasis. Nothing more to it. Just remember those words. So what factors do we need to control through homeostasis? There are four you need to remember. Now for this example, I want you to imagine a runner running a marathon because this is an excellent platform for you to understand how our internal conditions change and how if we don't regulate them, we will die. So firstly, we need to maintain a constant level of ions in our body. Ions are acquired through salts, so for example sodium is an example of an ion which we get from the salt sodium chloride, which is commonly known as table salt for you. And ions are incredibly important in maintaining our nervous system, a healthy running nervous system. But if we have too many ions, then what can happen is it can really mess around with the balance of water in our body and lead to severe dehydration and ultimately death. So in our running example, ions will be lost through sweat, and that's why sweat tastes salty. So this runner could perhaps replenish those ions by eating a pack of crisps. So ions are lost through sweat, but the levels of ions in our body are controlled through our kidneys. Now our kidneys are two organs found in our lower back region. And their job is to filter out the waste in our body and produce urine, which then leaves our body. Next up, and often linked to ions, we have to control the levels of water in our body. Now in our running example, water would be lost again through the sweat, but also through the breath because the runner would have an increased breathing rate. In fact, if you ask a lot of teachers, I bet after lesson they feel very thirsty because they've had to expend a lot of water in their breath whilst teaching. And water levels are also controlled by the kidneys. So if your body has lost a lot of water through, let's say, sweating and breathing, the urine produced by your kidneys will actually be very dark in colour. And that's because it's more concentrated and has less water diluting it. Because our body needs to conserve that water, not get rid of it. If, however, you've had a lot to drink and haven't moved around a lot, hadn't exercised, then your body would produce urine which is light in colour because it's more diluted. Normally, after a night's sleep, you'd probably produce light coloured urine. So next up, we need to control our body temperature. Incredibly important. We must make sure that our internal body temperature around our core organs is 37 degrees Celsius. If body temperature goes too high, then basically our enzymes, which are basically proteins which carry out chemical reactions which keep us alive, their shape changes and they can no longer bind to the chemicals they need to. Basically, if your enzymes can't do that, if they can't bind to these important chemicals, then that chemical reaction stops working and those chemical reactions keep you alive. So if your enzymes are subject to high temperatures, we say they denature and that results in your death. In fact, if you're ever infected by a bacterial infection, let's say, and you have a fever, your body's actually raising its own temperature to destroy the enzymes in the bacteria, which keep the bacteria alive. But obviously, you've got to be careful because you don't want to risk denaturing or destroying your own enzymes. 
So the brain, or more specifically the hypothalamus, a part of the brain, um, that will detect changes in blood temperature. The brain can also receive information from the skin about external temperature and change conditions in the body accordingly. Finally, our body must control its own blood sugar levels. Just like in the case of ions, if blood sugar levels go too high, it can really affect the water balance in your body and lead to dehydration, which can lead to death. This is especially true if you're diabetic and can't produce a hormone called insulin, which controls your blood sugar levels. So basically, our blood sugar level rises when we intake carbohydrates, sugars. And our blood sugar levels drop when we use these sugars as fuel to power the process of respiration. This is the process that gives us energy for, let's say, movement. So obviously, this runner needs to move. And to move, they require muscular contraction. For those muscles to contract and relax, you need energy in the form of carbohydrates or glucose. And and that glucose is used to fuel the process of respiration, which gives us energy. So basically, these muscles will need to carry out a lot of respiration, so they'll need a lot of glucose. So as they're using up glucose, this runner's blood glucose levels are dropping. So just to tie it all in together, remember, as this runner's running, their ion levels are going down because they're sweating. Their water levels are going down because they're sweating and expelling a lot of breath. Their body temperature is going up because as their muscles contract and carry out respiration, it releases body heat. And of course, their blood sugar levels are going down as they're using more glucose for respiration to power their muscles. Now, obviously, the body can't go on like this forever. And that's why some athletes have been known to collapse from exhaustion. But our body does have a remarkable way of adapting to all these changes, at least for a short period of time, to keep us alive. For specifics on this, you will need to look at other tutorials on homeostasis. As I said, this is just an overview. And that is how you describe the four factors that must be controlled by our body. So homeostasis is maintained by something called negative feedback. Negative feedback systems keep us alive when our internal environment changes. So let's look at the negative feedback pathway. It's very similar to what you've seen before in the nervous system. So any negative feedback system in homeostasis starts off with a stimulus. A stimulus is the change in the internal environment. Okay, For example, your body temperature goes up or your body temperature goes down. Your blood sugar levels go up or your blood sugar levels go down. Then there's a part of your body that can detect that change, so we call that the receptor. For example, your brain and skin detect changes in temperature. Then the information gets sent for processing, but you don't need to talk too much about that because that's more to do with the nervous system. So then we reach the most important part of the system, which are the effectors. Most exam questions or six mark exam questions on homeostasis will require you to describe the roles of different effectors in various negative feedback systems. For example, describe the role of the effectors which bring about a change in temperature or a change in blood sugar level. But that's for another tutorial. So remember, just like in the nervous system, an effector can be a muscle or a gland. Muscles contract to bring about changes, glands secrete hormones or enzymes to bring about changes. And finally, the effectors bring about the response. A response is the reversal to the initial change that occurred within our body. That's why I've drawn a coin being flipped. So it's this reversal that's referred to as negative feedback. So think of the initial change that occurred within our body as a positive change. I don't mean positive as in a good thing, but just a change in one direction. And the negative feedback system has reversed that change. So they put a negative to cancel out the positive. This is why this system is called a negative feedback system. And in other tutorials, you'll learn specific examples of negative feedback. Just to review one more time, the stimulus is the change in the internal environment, the receptor is the part of the body that detects that change, an effector will either be a muscle or gland which does something to start reversing that change, and the response is the actual reversal of the change, and that brings about negative feedback. And that is explaining how negative feedback is achieved in our body.